Hey, hey, welcome to Film Fanatics. We are three film geeks discussing movies new and old. My name is Dan. My name is Justin. And I'm Joe. This week our new releases include the latest Tom Hanks film, Captain Phillips, and the Ron Howard-directed Rush. Our new classic this week is our first animated one, The Adventures of Tintin. Our old classic is another Ron Howard-helmed film, 1992's Far and Away, and our Oscar-nominee A to Z film this time is 1988's The Accused, which netted a Best Actress Award for Jodie Foster. As we've got sort of a running theme here of Ron Howard films, our top five this week is Howard-directed films, so we'll get to all of that. But before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about one of the films we reviewed last week on the show, and also something we've been talking about lately, and that is 3D. Gravity, coming off a 55 million opening weekend, which is an October record, performed very strongly during the week and dropped only 21% in its second weekend, earning it an incredible $123 million over just 10 days, something never really seen outside of summer except for your franchise films. Even more remarkable, though, and we were just talking about how low 3D attendance has been this year, with the 2013 high of just 50% of ticket sales for Pacific Rim. But Gravity killed it in 3D with 80% in sales opening weekend and an even better 82% this weekend, something Avatar never even was able to do. Now, all three of us gave Gravity grades in the A range last week, but what is it about this film specifically that's, that's breaking all the records? Joe, what do you think the success is here? Well, I think it really has to do with what we kind of briefly talked about before, that when 3D is implemented well in certain scenarios, that's what makes for a successful film utilizing that technique. And I think Gravity is just one of those examples. It just really, really put a lot of time and effort into its production and really enhancing those effects. And that's what makes it a really thrilling experience, is using the 3D to its advantage. And it's just an example of a film using that really well. And that's why the tickets are doing so well. It's really reflecting that, I think. Justin, what do you think? I think it's really helping 3D complement film as an overall art form. It can work very, very well. However, it is very time consuming and does usually cost a lot of money. And because of the weight on the cameras themselves, new ways and methods have to be incorporated to adapt accordingly. I think that the reception is largely because of word of mouth. And I think when something is deserving of shelling out extra money for it, the results speak for themselves. And I think that's what we're seeing here with Gravity. And I hope that it inspires movie studios to take more time with the 3D instead of running straight for post-conversion. I do think that the second weekend and how well it did through the week is certainly indicative of the word of mouth. But what about the amazing $55 million opening weekend? Nobody really had seen the movie yet other than critics, which it did do very, very well with critics. But how much do you think is marketing? Because obviously... You know, we're always kind of marketed these 3D effects shoved down our throats. Why this specific instance was 3D the way to go? And people seem to know that right from the start. Do you think it was just the way it was advertised? I think it was largely the critics themselves. Word of mouth spreads. And when people hear from a credible source that 3D helps a film instead of becoming a blurry mess, people get interested. People get intrigued. And a lot of people were very skeptical about the overall trailers of Gravity. But to hear all, all these reception involving, oh, this, this really brings you into the story, I think that's what sold people on it. I think it might also have to do something with the credibility of the director, Alfonso Cuaron, having done Children of Men. I think that that really helped to establish some of the weight behind the film. And I think that kind of goes hand in hand with the critics just saying something really good about it. As to how that added with the 3D, I think that it was just really a good build-up through marketing, as you're suggesting. That's kind of what I think, because, I mean, like we talked about when we did the 3D show, Pacific Rim, the biggest 3D of the year, was only at 50% in ticket sales. This mm-hmm. is almost double that, 80 82% in, in the 3D sales. Well, to be fair, a lot of films really try to push 3D when they're using it. Like, you have to see it in 3D. Right. And one interesting thing about Gravity, through the trailers and its advertising... There was almost no mention of 3D. It was almost just kind of selling that point by itself and kind of maybe just holding back little intercuts of the film. It didn't give away too much. It was like a slow buildup. That might have something to do with the excitement because they really didn't try to ram 3D down your throat. It just looked like a good visual experience in general. You know, that's true because actually until maybe two or three weeks before the movie came out, I don't think I realized it even was in 3D. 
So that is a good point. Especially action movies tend to really, really ram it down in the previews. Well, as your example through Pacific Rim, they would not stop just kind of like blowing yeah. it out of proportion. I think maybe people just got kind of overwhelmed. Like, you know what? I'm not going to trust them. This might be just a cheesy monster flick. I'll just go see it in 2D and see how it looks. And, you know, it looked pretty good in 2D, so I don't know. Justin, any final thoughts? Joe brought up a very good point with the director, who's obviously gotten some credibility as a very uh, talented, very artistically focused director. In an interview uh, prior to Gravity, he actually vowed he would never do another movie in 3D because it took so long to get this right. And if that's the case, I think he and en- he began and ended on a very strong note. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, it does bring up a good point that this stuff is not easy, and this does need time to get right, and I hope that if 3D does continue to get explored, we find ways to make it much faster and much more efficient, so we don't have to settle for cheap knockoffs so easily. Yeah, I think hopefully the studios learn from this, that people will go to 3D, but they need to see a superior product mm-hmm. and not an afterthought like a World War Z. There has to be good effort put into it. All right, so first up on our new release docket, we've got Captain Phillips. And Joe, tell us about that. Well, Captain Phillips follows Captain Rich Phillips, and it's based on the true story of the piracy attacks on a U.S. freighter back in 2009. It was something you probably heard about in the news. And this was basically a fairly accurate dramatization of that. And it essentially follows Rich Phillips on his freighter as it's overtaken by pirates. And during the conflict... He manages to get the pirates off the boat onto a lifeboat, but ends up becoming essentially a hostage in a major international incident. And it basically follows his struggle to stay alive in this really huge situation. One thing I really enjoyed about this film is that I thought that they were really doing a good job of trying to capture the realism of the event. It didn't feel too overly Hollywoodized to me. It felt like it could be a very gritty, realistic portrayal of the events that actually happened. I felt that it was being very true to that. And the performances were really, really grounded, and the dialogue just seemed very, very believable to me, very realistic. I thought the performances were really, really excellent for the film. I mean, Tom Hanks just delivers as usual. And I have to say that the action in this film, the the tension, the score, the editing, were all very fluid. A lot of great shots out in the ocean. And it just really all helped to boggle down that strong sense of just the groundedness and that believability that really made it strong. Really, the only thing I had was kind of a a minor gripe, and that kind of involved the use of the shaky cam. And I understood the stylistic nature of that because it takes place on the ocean. So the bobbing and weaving made sense to me, and I thought that also added to the realism. But I also found it to be kind of annoying. On the whole, though, I think the strongest point of the film was focusing on Captain Phillips' struggle. And Tom Hanks really, really just was the main strength of that. And it really led up to this really powerful climax that honestly had me in tears. And I think that that is really the center of this. It's just that really, really poignant effort of bringing something like this to life and not holding back any punches. I really was impressed by the film and I gave it an A-. minus. If I had to summarize my review for Captain Phillips, I'd probably leave it like this. Come see it for Tom Hanks. Stay for everyone else. I thought the remainder of the ensemble was fantastic, especially the newcomers who played the pirates, who managed to be both chilling and yet somewhat compassionate and also give this sort of naivety to the overall situation that they're in. And I thought that was both intriguing and also terrifying at the exact same time. Hanks does a very good job, but I think his character doesn't really come to life until the very end of the film. Tension in the film kind of comes and goes. I personally think the majority of the scenes in the film ran on a little too long. I personally thought that the film would have benefited largely from having about 10 minutes or so removed. But overall, I was very satisfied with the product. I can't say I'm a huge fan of Paul Greengrass, the director of the film. He did United 93, which was a fantastic movie, but he also made Borden Supremacy, which I was not a big fan of, and Born Ultimatum, which I thought was okay, but everyone else obviously deemed a blockbuster. But to be fair, this was, this was a pretty good movie. I can't say it's everything I wanted it to be, but it's good for what it is. Captain Phillips gets a B from me. I'm definitely a little more with Joe on this one. Now, first of all, color me in the camp of really enjoying the Bourne films. I think Paul Greengrass is a really good director, especially in 
let's say, small spaces. I thought United 93 was fantastic. And I think he employs a lot of the same techniques here because, you know, instead of an airplane, it's on a boat, especially once Captain Phillips and the pirates get into the little boat. I mean, that is a cramped space. And Greengrass really made it not a wide space, but he did a lot with the small space. Those close quarters. It was it was very close quarters, and it was a little bit reminiscent of a United 93 because obviously the whole movie more or less takes place on that plane. So I really thought he did a good job here. He never really lets the action get away from him. He's told this horrific story with a lot of intensity, but at the same time never losing focus on the people involved. And I think that's something that most action movies tend to lose in the process. If you look at pretty much every action movie from the first, let's say, quarter of the year, Bullet to the Head, The Last Stand, Parker, they're all these shoot 'em ups where you never really get to explore the characters at all because they're too busy putting bullets in people's heads. Whereas here, it's equally intense and character driven. Captain Phillips, you really get a sense of who he is right from the beginning. You know, him and his wife are driving to the job site and are having a little exchange there. And his initial interactions with the crew before the pirates come into the picture, you know, you really get a sense of who he is and that character gets strengthened throughout. The only real complaints I have with the movie are, I think by the end the directing does get a little bit manic, and I think that may have to do with the whole shaky cam business, because at the end, not only the close quarters, but once some other factors get involved in the story, I don't want to give away too much for those of you that weren't reading up on the news when it happened, but there was a lot going on at the end, and the shaky cam aspect didn't really help me with that. But other than that, I mean, I I really think... Captain Phillips is a solid movie and one of the best action films of the year for sure. Uh, Captain Phillips also gets an A- minus from me. All right, up next we're going to deal with Rush and Justin, you've got that. Okay, so Rush focuses on racers James Hunt, played by Chris Hemsworth, and Nikki Lauda, played by Daniel Bruhl, who have a vicious rivalry. They come from two very different lives and yet both are after the exact same thing, winning. Rush chronicles the six years of their rivalry as the two fight to become champion of the world in their sport and try to answer the ultimate question of racing. What would you do to win? Rush really benefits from taking an unbiased, honest portrayal of both racers. None of the lead actors are are portrayed as great, flawless human beings, but they present themselves in a way that the audience can literally root for either side, regardless of the outcome already being known. It doesn't necessarily try to make any of the crash sequences overly gruesome, but it doesn't necessarily play it safe either. However, what does keep this from getting an A, and I do have to confess, when I did see this, I was relatively close, and that may have played a part in this, was the strange kind of graininess of the overall product. I thought maybe uh, Ron Howard may have been trying to do this to make it look older, but it seemed kind of odd and and at some points overexposed, especially when minor CGI is thrown into it when some of the more intense sequences happen. Admittedly, I think this might change as the year goes on, but for right now, Rush is a very good movie, and it gets an equally well-deserved A-. minus. Joe? Um, I pretty much agree with what you said, Justin. I thought that it was, once again, another story which was based on true events, but obviously this one I think was more overly dramatized and Hollywoodized, but that's to be expected. It's a very fun film, has a lot of good action, and it really did uh, enhance the quality of just racing in general, something that I'm not a big fan of but i thought it was actually quite exciting and the chase scenes were really really good on the track for the formula one races i thought the strongest element of the film was the performances of the two main actors and just the writing of those two characters really did show a very human aspect as you said and they're so dynamically written that you really can root for either side and it shows the real strengths and weaknesses of the men and their darker and lighter natures and i do like how they kind of slowly grow to have this mutual respect for each other despite their rivalry and the hardships that they endure overall i thought it was an enjoyable film and i really don't have any significant flaws with it i would give it an a i thought rush 
was also very good. I'm a little bit on the lower end of the spectrum, but I thought the racing scenes were fantastic. What I love the most about Rush is that it was a movie about two people and not just James Hunt. All the ads and the posters made it look, to me anyway, like it was solely Chris Hemsworth's movie. And if anything, I think it was even more about Nicky Lauda than Hunt. And I thought that the dynamic between the two of them was just fantastic. There were a couple real intense scenes with it. You expect a movie about auto racing to have a couple of intense crash scenes and hospital scenes, and there were a couple things that I had to turn away from. Also, just as a, on a personal note, I've totaled two cars in the rain over the last few years, so watching all the racing in the rain was super intense for me, probably, you know, more than it might be for somebody else. I thought the stuff about Hunt's personal life and to a lesser degree, Lauda's personal life was a little bit boring. But the racing scenes and scenes between the two of them, even the ones off the track, I thought more than made up for that. So I leave Rush with a B plus. I actually would say that what prevented me from giving an A plus was actually that element of the film. I thought that those particular elements of their personal lives weren't explored quite enough. Or particularly in James Hunt's case, I thought that it kind of made him seem obnoxious and even more unlikable, right. which made it tough for me to get behind him. I actually did kind of lean more with Nicky Lauda's character, but you could go either way on that one. Who did you root for in general in the movie? Honestly, it went back and forth as I kind of learned more about them, but I I guess I, towards the end of the film, the way it was progressing, I actually did want James Hunt to win because I felt that Nicky Lauda had won previously so he already had his championship and not to give anything away but his real victory was kind of off the track mm -hmm. which i really liked more and i thought that was really excellent portrayal of his growth and that's i guess one reason why i thought that he was more sympathetic of a character in that sense i was more behind him but in terms of just the racing i was fine with um thor winning <laughs> and by the way the answering your question the primary reason it was probably marketed that way was because of Chris Hemsworth. Oh, I'm sure. You know, it's I... like, oh, Thor's in this movie. Let's go see it. Right. So it's an obvious marketing ploy. But it worked, I think. It's interesting that you bring up the fact that it, it, the marketing made it seem like Chris Hemsworth's movie. That was actually one of the things I really liked about the marketing. The first trailer made it look like it was going to focus solely on Nikki Lauda. And then the trailer following that took this perspective of James Hunt. And I thought that really fit the spirit of the movie. It really took a look at both sides and presented them with about the same equal amount of screen time without trying to make one bias towards the other. That must have been lost on me then because I don't remember seeing a trailer about Nicky Lauda. So if I did, I must not have connected it with the same film that they were promoting Chris Hemsworth in. So I guess for me, the marketing maybe was a little bit lost, but that is an interesting, that's an interesting take that they would have had with it. To really, you know, market to each one. If they did that, that would really reinforce the theme. Yeah, it re it really would. I'm I'm actually, I'm kind of bummed that I it sort of was lost on me. Yeah, I missed that one too. That's because <laughs> that really was my favorite part of the movie. Is that it wasn't exactly what I expected because it was a duo piece between the two of them. I agree. That was a surprise. I didn't think it was going to focus as much on Nicky Lauda. I thought he was going to be a straight up villain, more mm -hmm. or less. But I was wrong. I do agree that the movie looked. I don't know if old is the word, but a little bit retro. I don't know. I, I thought it was a pretty strong choice, actually, because it really did bring you into the time period. I thought that it was a very modern-looking film, but I, I saw the graininess, too, but I thought that was just kind of sticking with the time period they were going for. And that might have been what they were trying to go for. I, I don't know a whole lot about what went into 70s films. Well, just speaking from the 70s films I've seen, a lot of them are kind of grainier and darker in tone. Agreed, and same from what I've seen. But I, I didn't know if that was like what they were going for, if that was actually like a, a technical flaw. To me, it, it sort of stuck out, and it, it sort of felt, like I said, uh, somewhat overexposed in some spots, particularly during the uh, rain sequences. No, it, it definitely stuck out to me as well, but I actually kind of liked it. I thought it was a, a cool choice. Uh, all right, well, let's move on now to Baggage Claim. Now, in this one, Paula Patton plays Montana Moore, a flight attendant who's desperately trying to get engaged before her little sister gets married in 30 days' time. Suddenly, it's all hands on deck, and everybody she works with at the airport, from the ticket counter to the TSA agents, is on the lookout for any of Montana's exes flying that month so she can give them another chance to sweep her off her feet. This movie, overall, is pretty dreadful. 
Uh, it's a completely generic and uninteresting romantic comedy that provides little in the categories of romance or comedy. To top it off, Montana is a whiny, immature, unlikable character. The only thing for me saving this movie from giving it an F, and I mean the only thing, is that Jill Scott and Adam Brody, as Montana's best friends and co-workers in flight, have a few funny lines and play pretty well off each other. But there really isn't a whole lot else going on here. There's a lot of talented actors wasted, and I give Baggage Claim a D. Justin? Uh, where do I start with this one? This truly felt like watching a direct-to-DVD movie on screen. The storyline was completely unbelievable. None of it even made that much sense. I called the twists, I want to say, less than 10 minutes into the movie. Acting was appalling, and I do mean that in the very sense of the word. It's even a struggle to even talk about this one because it <laughs> was truly that bad. Admittedly, I got where Dan's coming from with the two characters. I guess they were mildly amusing. I really didn't think they were that funny. But for me, it was a complete and utter mess. I don't know how this got a theatrical run. Baggage claim gets an F. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I was rolling in the aisles with them. But to me, they were just one, like, little bright spot. I thought Jill Scott actually was pretty funny. You know, she used kind of her curvy body to her benefit in, in some of the jokes. and But yeah, boy, the whole premise of the movie is so stupid <laughs> and ridiculous and outlandish. It was just so blah. Joe, what did you think of Baggage Claim? Uh, well, I thought it was one of the most predictable movies I'd ever seen. I know that there's cheesiness out there too, but I thought the dialogue was pretty dreadful. The characters, like the main character, I thought was really unlikable. She's so unlikable. I didn't really, and I some of the things she did to try and, I think she started stalking her boyfriend and it was supposed to be funny or something, and I just didn't quite get that, and I guess there were a few funny parts here and there, and I mean, it was trying to be charming, but I really didn't think that it was a success in any way. I, there was really nothing that saved it for me. I, I'd give it an F. Wow. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess my, my D is probably pretty generous for it, but... I mean, I could kind of see that because there were a few funny lines, but I, I don't think it was enough to save the movie. Right, me. right. All right, finally we have Grace Unplugged. Justin? All right, so in Grace Unplugged, A.J. Mishalka plays Grace Trey, a determined young girl living in her hard rocker turned Christian father's legacy. Though when her father turns down an opportunity to bring back the song that made him famous, Grace brings forth a remake that surpasses the original and is thrust into the world of stardom and slowly discovers it may not be as glamorous as she thought. I'll be honest, I really didn't want to give two Fs in one show, so I really was trying to do my best <laughs> to, to find the good in this movie. The fact of the matter is, there is little good to say about this movie, if at all. Though I can say I did not... I really didn't begin to loathe this movie until about the start of Act 2. I can say without question this is some of the cheesiest acting I have ever seen put to film. Through a number of horribly edited montages that are supposed to imply narrative development, the film just becomes a tedious mess. Mishoka's talent never really came to form to me, it never really seemed apparent. I honestly thought she was underwhelming if anything, and the songs themselves the few that actually were in the film were instantly forgettable to me. Maybe the Christian community can find something out of this, but for me, this was just a completely low-budget waste of a film. Grace Unplugged, sadly, gets an F. I really have to uh, disagree with this one. I, I don't think it was a total home run, but I, I think an F is pretty harsh. I thought in Grace Unplugged, the first half hour... And really everything else after that with Grace's family was pretty good. I thought the dynamic specifically between her and her dad was good. I thought the dynamic between the dad and the mom, played by James Denton from Desperate Housewives and Shawnee Smith from Becker, was good. Once she gets to L.A., it really does become pretty cliche and just hairs up from a Lifetime original movie. Her manager is very formulaic and your classic evil character in a Christian-type film. 
But I have to say, I thought Kevin Pollock did a good job. I tend to like him in most things that he's in, and I think he did play the part very well. As far as the songs are concerned, I actually thought the the couple original ones that were written for the film weren't bad. I thought the hit song that Grace covers, that, like you said, uh, was originally from her dad's songbook, I thought was pretty decent. I could see with the auto-tuning and everything, the remix that they uh, provided when she shot the music video in the in the movie, was pretty decent. I could actually kind of see it on the charts. And the one she writes at the end of the movie, I didn't think was terrible. I mean, you said they were instantly forgettable. Am I humming them today? No. But as it was going on, I sort of thought, all right, well, these are pretty decent songs for this kind of a movie. I thought that AJ was not a horrible actress. I don't think she's going to win any awards anytime soon. But I thought she was pretty realistic, and the character itself was fairly believable, and like I said, especially with the family stuff. The montages are dreadful. That you are spot on with. The montages where, you know, we're supposed to see her slow decline into oh, this is what L.A.'s like, and did I make a mistake coming out here? And That really is, I think, the worst that the movie has to offer. But you didn't find anything redeeming in this film. Oh, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that it didn't have moments of possible inspiration to certain people. It was just, I thought, was hammy and poorly put together. Don't you think, though, that the stuff with Grace and her dad specifically was all pretty... I mean, it may not be bringing anything new to the table, but, I mean, didn't you find their scenes fairly realistic, especially if she's growing up in this very Christian household and she's starting to rebel a bit? Not particularly. I thought those were horribly acted and even worse written. Okay, but you did say that up until she goes to L.A., you thought there was the possibility of not giving it an F. So, obviously, there was something in there that you liked. It was honestly falling into so bad, it was almost entertaining. All right. I do not agree with that. I leave Grace Unplugged with a C-. All right. Well, we are going to move into our top five now, and that is our Ron Howard-directed films. He's got many, many good ones, and he's even won an Oscar for his directing. And we're going to go over now our top five Ron Howard films. And Joe, we're going to start with you. Let's hear numbers five through two. All right. Number five is one we talked about very recently. That would be Rush. I thought that it was actually something from Ron Howard that I had not seen too much of before. We got a little bit of it in Far Away, which we'll talk about later, kind of with the chase scenes. But really, I just thought it was a really well-directed film, and I enjoyed it. Pretty much what I already said. My number four would be Beautiful Mind. I thought it was one of Russell Crowe's best performances. I also liked the really interesting concepts of the film through the mind of a genius kind of bordering on insanity, dealing with these really high concepts, but also trying to have to balance his his personal life while having so much at stake. I actually thought it was a really gripping tale, and I kind of liked the borderline supernatural elements I thought were very interesting, but it was a really, really interesting film, and it really stands out to me it, for uniqueness alone. Number three is Da Vinci Code. Another good Tom Hanks movie. I thought it dealt with a lot of interesting concepts. It was a good thrill ride. Really enjoyed a lot of the twists and turns. A lot of great performances for some great actors. Really enjoyed that one. And number two would be Cocoon. Kind of a sci-fi comedy from the 80s. One I grew up watching a lot. Thought it was really cool dealing with the really benign aliens with senior citizens. It's kind of fun little tale about youth and kind of rediscovering the simplicity in life. And a lot of really good fun performances, and including our famous diabetes guy. So <laughs> it was it was an enjoyable film. I really liked Cocoon. Two of those on your list I have not seen. Which ones? Uh, the Da Vinci Code and Cocoon. Really? Yeah. I recommend Cocoon. You know, it's funny. I actually, we sort of came up with this top five just a few days before recording the podcast here, and I had attempted to see at least one or two of these Ron Howard films that I have missed, mm-hmm. and Netflix didn't have any of them. Um, well, well, I mean, I think you can tell from this list and probably from the list we're going to read, there's a lot of range here in these yes. movies for Ron Howard. Well, and, you know, and that's, he does comedy well, he does drama, he does some action. We got a little bit of, you know, some thriller, we got some sci-fi, we got everything. Yeah. That's cool. Um, but Cocoon was definitely on, on the short list of movies I wanted to try and see I, I recommend it. we did the it's podcast. It's a 
it's a very lighthearted and and warm film. It's got a great message and it's it's fun and it's corny in a very eighties way, but it's memorable and there's a lot of good heart behind it. I, I do recommend it if you guys haven't seen it. All right, well, my top five starts out with Night Shift. This is a comedy film from 1982, one of the first times we see Michael Keaton. And Ron Howard uh, also directs his Happy Days co-star, The Fonz, Henry Winkler, in this. It's really, really quite funny. It still holds up pretty well. I saw it probably three years ago again, and uh, I liked it pretty much just as much as I did when I was younger. My number four is Frost Nixon. And we discussed this when we did our uh, favorite presidential portrayals. I thought Frank Langella does a fantastic Nixon. And uh, also, we just recently lost David Frost, the real David Frost. But he is portrayed very well here as well. Um, The movie does go on a little bit long, which I think sometimes is uh, one of Howard's weak points. Sometimes he doesn't quite know how to wrap up a story. Um, but I thought the performances alone on Frost Nixon really do bring it above and beyond. My number three is A Beautiful Mind. Um, I agree with you on pretty much everything there. I thought that was a very well-told story. Russell Crowe's maybe best performance. A lot of twists and turns there. And that is one that I'm really looking forward to seeing again when we, uh, when it comes up on the Oscar A to Z probably in about a year or so. Definitely. Uh, Because I've only seen it once, and I would love to catch that again. Mm -hmm. Uh, And my number two is Apollo 13, another uh, Tom Hanks, Ron Howard pairing. And I suppose the first one. Uh, Oh, no, I guess Splash would have been the first one. And I thought they did a great job with it. I thought the performances in Apollo 13 were great here as well. Kevin Bacon was great. And just the story, you know, it's funny, Tom Hanks... You know, we talked about him doing Captain Phillips this week, a real-life story about sort of a crisis happening, um, you know, not off of the Earth in that case, but away from everybody. And Apollo 13 is, you know, kind of similar. He's up in space and uh, sort of fighting for his life. And uh, I thought Apollo 13 was just really, really great. So that is my number two. Justin? All right. Number five for me is Backdraft. Now, despite this being described by some as unrealistic in terms of actual firefighting, I thought this was a very good movie with some incredible special effects, particularly with pyrotechnics. It has one of my favorite Kurt Russell performances, but unfortunately it's massively pulled down by Billy Baldwin in the lead role. As everything is. (laughs) Essentially, yes. Uh, Number four for me is Rush. Uh, Ron Howard loves his cars. His first film was Grand Theft Auto. And this just showcases that love and passion for them perfectly. The performances from Brule and Hemsworth are amazing. I thought they did fantastic jobs. And I really did like the 70s vibe that gave it a sort of retro quality. But as I said before, the graininess and the introduction to modern day elements, like some CGI to touch up some of the accident sequences... I thought sort of pulled it down a little bit, so that's why it ended up as my number four. Number three is Cinderella Man. I thought this was a great underdog story set in the Great Depression, which I think is an incredible time to focus on in terms of movies. What I thought was really interesting about this one is it's probably as consistently fascinating with what's going on outside the ring as it is inside it. But what really stands out for this and what really makes it my number three comes from a fantastic job by Paul Giamatti as the co-star of Russell Crowe in this, and I believe it got him a nomination for Best Supporting Actor, and I have no problem saying he should have won. And my number two is Frost Nixon. I thought this was a very, very good movie. I talked about this in a uh, earlier podcast. I thought the square-offs between uh, Michael Sheen and Frank Langella as David Frost and Richard Nixon were edge-of-your-seat suspenseful. I thought the supporting cast was great, uh, particularly Sam Rockwell, who... To some extent, sort of plays the same character in every single movie, but he's put to such great use in this, and he really does help the narrative. Uh, And you are correct about Paul Giamatti. He was nominated for Best Supporting Actor, and that's at the Oscars. At the Golden Globes, he was also nominated, and so was Russell Crowe for Best Actor in a Motion Picture Drama. Cinderella Man is definitely the one that was at the top of my list to see before we did the top five, and unfortunately, like I said, it wasn't on Netflix Instant. But I do really want to see that. I'm really coming around on Russell Crowe. I, 
I can't say I wasn't a fan. I just didn't see a whole lot of his stuff prior to probably A Beautiful Mind was the first. And I only saw that maybe five years ago. But I really am coming around on him. So I was I was hoping to see uh, Cinderella Man. Would you say that you've been entertained? I have been entertained. <laughs> Good. All right. So let's uh, talk about our number one films from the Ron Howard arsenal. Joe? My number one film from Ron Howard is Ransom. It's probably one of my favorite thrillers. It really deals, I think, with the discomfort of kidnappings more than most other movies I've ever seen. It's probably one of Mel Gibson's better performances in the 90s, and probably Gary Sinise's best performance that I've ever seen as a villain. It's got some really memorable dialogue. It's got some really great twists and turns. It's a very dark film, and I will admit it's probably not for everyone, but I think it does a really good job of keeping up the suspense, and it's really underrated. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Cool. Cool. That is one I have to check out as well. Uh, my number one, I know Justin hasn't seen. Joe, I don't know if you've seen this, but my favorite Ron Howard movie is Parenthood. This is the, the film version, of course. It's now a TV series for the second time uh, on NBC. But originally it was starring Steve Martin and Mary Steenburgen as a couple really struggling with some family issues, not just with their kids, but with their immediate family as well. Rick Moranis plays a great role here as a competitive dad. Diane Wiest is the mother. And Keanu Reeves plays a really, really funny role. Uh, It's funny. It's touching. It's got some drama to it. But more than anything, it is realistic. The family scenes are realistic. You know, a lot of things that happen obviously are a little bit exaggerated, but the characters themselves are all really spot on. And this was a favorite of my whole household growing up. So I, I've seen this one a bunch, and uh, Parenthood's definitely recommended from me, and it is my number one. Justin? Well, uh, I also need to get on that. Ransom, I would like to, to have you know, Joe, almost made my top five. Oh, wow. I was really down to the wire between that and Backdraft. but um, He's got a lot of good films. It's tough. He, he really does. He really does. But for me, number one, as I believe it came up on your list, Dan, was Apollo 13. Mm. I thought this... Great movie. It is Tom Hanks at his finest. I thought the storyline was nail-bitingly intense, almost too much so to, to question whether or not it actually was a true story, and yet it really was, and it just really got me on the edge of my seat and gave me this great margin of error as to whether or not these guys were actually going to be able to make it back after everything that happened. And what really helps bring that together is the ensemble cast. Uh, Dan brought up Kevin Bacon. Just overall, a fantastic movie, and that's why I had to make it my number one. Well, and I think a lot of these you know, repeat performers really does speak to what a good director Ron Howard is. People want to come back to him and do multiple movies with him. Tom Hanks, Russell Crowe, Gary Sinise. Ed Harris. Ed Harris. And I've heard nothing but really good things about you know Ron Howard as a director and just as a person in general, but it really does go to show that he's respected in the industry. You know, these are some heavyweight names, your Tom Hanks's and such. It's funny because the list of films doesn't really sound like too many that people would talk about all the time, like the films that wouldn't really stand out in general conversation but they're all good solid films that are memorable and you can come back and watch them and i think the best thing about ron howard just looking at through this list before we talked about it in this podcast i didn't realize a lot of the films i saw were his movies because mm-hmm. he does so many things in so many genres he's got a lot of talent and really i don't think i've seen many really bad films by him yeah, yeah, my number one on the list, Parenthood. I I forget that that is a Ron Howard movie. He, he, you know, when you think of directors, you think of you know Scorsese and Spielberg. Nobody automatically comes up with Ron Howard because he doesn't stick to one one shtick. Most That's directors probably it. Like with Scorsese, it's usually crime and mafia. With Spielberg, right. it's usually science fiction. It's everybody's got their niche, and Ron Howard's not afraid to go beyond that. Though I have noticed that he does seem to have a pattern of focusing on real-life grounded stories, or at least stories focusing on realism. I agree. And a lot of his stories are real stories, like Apollo 13 or A Beautiful Mind. But yeah, even the characters are, they're just very grounded in reality. Mm -hmm. Just as an aside, a movie that just narrowly missed my list that I think gets a lot of criticism, although some people do love it, is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Personally, 
I love it. Now, I'm a huge Jim Carrey fan. There's not a whole lot that he's done I don't love. But I thought that, especially for the first Dr. Seuss adaptation film, he did a really good job with it. It was lively. It was colorful. The songs were good. What do you guys think of How the Grinch Stole Christmas? I'll be honest. The first time I saw it, I really, really enjoyed it. That said, when I came out, I want to say I was 11 or 12, give or take. While I can't say that I have the same opinion of it now, the one thing I really do like about it is the fact that Ron Howard did try to implement new things to expand upon the mythology Dr. Seuss set forth within that story. And for the most part, it really worked. They're probably my favorite scenes in the movie, particularly when he uh, explores the overall origin of the Grinch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I thought that was really cool. I was still sort of choking up when I saw it on DVD, and even though I was a little bit underwhelmed that time, those scenes still really sold me. I think in terms of just trying to make a kid's movie, as we uh, mentioned before, Ron Howard really does try to branch out and does it relatively fearlessly. It wasn't without flaws, but it was pretty good. Joe, what did you think? I think that he did a really good job of trying to bring the cartoony elements of Dr. Seuss's story to kind of a more gritty, realistic you know, portrayal. I thought that he really did a good job of creating that world of the Who's. And I thought Jim Carrey was funny as the Grinch. I mean, mm-hmm. he's he, his style of comedy worked for the most part. I really did like it. I, expanding on the mythology was a good point. I, I liked that as well. Uh, the only real problem I have with the movie is that I felt there were some moments that it was kind of uncomfortable. Like, some of the designs for the characters and some of the shots were a bit, a bit off. A lot of these strange tilting angles didn't mm-hmm. quite work for me. It was kind of just an awkward style of filming, but... Overall, I thought it was a decent film. I don't hate it. I, I watched it a few times as a kid, and I, I thought it was pretty good. All right, well, that's, I just wanted to pick your brains about that. Oh, and also, just a note, Cinderella Man almost made my top five as well. That's a good film. Well, speaking of adaptations of old cartoons and comics, uh, we've got The Adventures of Tintin for our new classic this week. Uh, Steven Spielberg and Peter Jackson team up to bring you this motion capture feature film version of one of the most successful comics and later television and radio shows of the 20th century from around the world. Just not really in America. For most of us, me included, this film was the introduction to the young reporter and crime solver. In this installment, our hero and his dog Snowy team up with a ship's captain to find a sunken ship left by one of the captain's ancestors. The motion capture animation of this movie is gorgeous. So much about it looks real. The scenery, really even Tintin himself, looks like a real person. Andy Serkis as well does a fantastic job, as he always does. He plays Captain Haddock here. And Nick Frost and Simon Pegg add great comic relief as Thompson and Thompson, bumbling detectives and Tintin's friends. I think there's a lot of parallels here to an Indiana Jones type story, and that was certainly being touted about when uh, the movie came out, and of course Spielberg's involvement involvement with Indiana Jones didn't hurt there. All in all, I think it's a good introduction to the U.S. of the character, and even though it didn't do all that well here, it predictably did very well around the world, and a sequel is actually being planned currently for around Christmas 2015. What's not so super about the movie for me is that the action starts to wear thin about halfway through, and other than some really cool shots and fun characters, it actually started to get a little bit boring. The adults will like this maybe a little more than kids. I know when we had it at the movie theater, kids weren't really clamoring for it, and it was out the same time period as Hugo, which I think was sort of similar. I think kids aren't maybe as enthralled with it uh, as their parents were. But, you know, Tintin is a good character. I think, you know, adding the reporter element into the crime solving is cool. The specific storyline for this movie I liked. I just thought that maybe it started to wear a little bit thin. So I leave Adventures of Tintin with a B plus. Joe? I agree with mostly everything you said. I thought that the motion capture of this film was really, really beautiful. It's probably the best motion capture that I've ever seen. I I like the style of filming, but I think that I haven't seen it really done that well in most films of its type. But this is probably the best example of that. I like Tintin's character. He was fun. I thought the voice acting was great. I liked the storyline. I thought it was really kind of cool. There was a mystical element of high adventure very similar to Indiana Jones, which Mm -hmm. which was nice to see. I think... You brought up an interesting point. I think this is really one of those films, it's kind of like a kid's movie for adults. It's 
fun. It's got those cartoony elements, but it's really got a lot of high concepts and cool plot points that I think adults would be able to follow, more so than possibly kids. But it's got some fun stuff for the family to enjoy overall. It's good quality storytelling. I do agree the action, while it is really cool, I think they try to show off a bit too much of it and it does wear thin. And it kept me interested enough throughout most of the film, but I do agree the length was maybe a bit too extensive. They could have shaved off maybe a little bit of time. But overall, it's a really enjoyable, fun film, and I liked it. I hope that the sequel will be just as good, if not better. I really want them to expand on this franchise. Uh, I would give it a B-plus as well. Yeah, when I came out of the film originally in the theater... I thought it was over two hours, and it's only like an hour 40. So it really, you start to feel that length towards the end of the movie, I think. And I, maybe that is because the action starts to wear thin. Maybe they could have kind of gotten through the storyline a little bit quicker. But I do agree that, I, I remember I liked Tintin. I've seen it several times, but you guys brought up seeing it again, and I thought, oh man... This is going to be another long movie, but <laughs> it's really not a long movie, but there's something about it, it. It just kind of it, feels that way. It feels over two hours. Like, okay, mm-hmm. this, I got to get buckled down for this, but it's not that long. I, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Justin, what'd you think of Tintin? All right. Well, I got to completely agree with you both on the fact that the motion capture animation is truly one of the most shining moments of the film. I'll be honest. There was a moment during the final battle and I'll be honest It could have fooled me in the fact that it may have been live action. I thought the script by Edgar Wright was very helpful for this matter, uh, especially with the incorporation of Simon Pegg and Nick Frost as the uh, comic relief characters for this. Mm -hmm. Uh, It definitely helped keep the story witty and not overly serious. That said, given the kind of dark tone that it takes from time to time in the storyline, it takes a little while to sort of like find the happy medium between the two. And uh, sort of adjust accordingly. So therefore, it's kind of hard to a- adapt. Like I said, the storyline kind of gets dark. I thought it was very unsettling for a family film. that I can't see a lot of parents being particularly easy going with this one. Particularly when they start making Captain Haddock's alcoholism a uh, running gag. Which I thought was effective, but I can see people getting easily offended by Honestly, overall, looking at it as a whole, I really did enjoy Tintin. I hope that they expand on it more and work past their flaws in the sequel in 2015. But there were some things that kept it from being what I really hoped it would have been. The Adventures of Tintin get to B-. minus. Well, you seem to like it a lot for a B-. minus. There are some very good things about Tintin. Mm-hmm. There are some very big issues with Tintin as well. Well, B- minus is... You know, something that he enjoyed, and it's technically a B for us, so that's pretty that's good. True. So, that's yeah, true. It's not bad. It just seems like we all had sort of the same flaws with it. I think, well, Justin, you brought up a good point about the tonal shift. I think that might be one issue we didn't quite mention about maybe maybe that added into the length and the dragging points of the story a little bit, maybe. I think particularly with, the, with some of the comedic elements, uh, Thompson and Thompson work particularly well. Some of the other elements, like there's a running bit with, an opera singer being able to sing so loud that she can shatter glass that yeah. I think got a little overplayed. Mm. Well, you know what? It, you bring up a good point. I really like uh, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, as you know, but I really wanted to see more of Thompson Thompson. They were one of the best parts of the movie for me, and they really they were funny, and I really wanted them to be more integral to the story, and we got more of them, but I think a little too late in the film. I agree. Yeah, I think we could have dealt with a couple more scenes featuring them. Even if they had like a little subplot, that would have broken up because it was kind of nice to get that freshness of going back to London and seeing what they were up to. And mm-hmm. I, I was really great when they were able to converge with Tintin for the main storyline, but we could have used more of them, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and I do also think that, obviously, I get why it was rated PG because it had to be, but it's just on that sort of cutting edge. Justin mentioned the alcoholism storyline. And there's definitely some some kind of gruesome murders for a PG movie. I think they could have really gone just a couple of shades darker and gotten into PG-13. But because of its animated status, I think it would have acted maybe like a Pirates of the Caribbean, which parents take their kids to in droves. And sort of got a lot of those similar, like, elements, especially with the stuff on the ship. So, Dan, basically what you're saying is you don't think that Tintin was bold enough, didn't take quite enough risks. 
Kind of. I mean, I, at some point, we'll have to get into a discussion of how flawed I find the whole rating system. But because we all sort of agree that it's maybe more of a parent's movie than a kid's movie anyway. Mm-hmm. So I guess why not go all out with it? And I know Steven Spielberg, you know, does very well with the PG rated kids movies. He's always done that, you know, as one of the things that he does. But maybe it could have amped the violence up just a little because i i thought it was pretty violent for a pg movie i i was really surprised to find out that it was pg with all the gruesome gun violence i i thought that was really surprising yeah i really think they could have just ratcheted up a couple of notches and made it a pg-13 movie and i don't know i mean it it wouldn't have done better in the box office that's for sure no but i think it might have been a better film hmm All right, we're going to move on to Far and Away, which is our old classic this week, brought to us by friend of the podcast, Jess. And uh, this is another Ron Howard movie. Here's another one where I had seen it and completely forgot that it was a Ron Howard movie until it rolled in the credits. Uh, And Justin is going to tell us about Far and Away. All right, so in Far and Away, Tom Cruise plays Joseph, a young farmer in Ireland whom after his father's death loses his land to the landlord from lack of payment. After his attempt for revenge fails miserably, he ends up running off with the landlord's daughter Shannon, played by Nicole Kidman for America, where he hopes to start a new life. Out of all of Ron Howard's films, I have no problem calling this my least favorite. That said, Far and Away does have some good moments within it. Uh, The general theme from the perspective of the Irish culture is, for the most part, interesting, albeit kind of hammed up by a particularly messy performance by Tom Cruise. Uh, For lack of a better word, his Irish accent is more than a little unconvincing. Uh, Alongside that, the film does fall prey to a number of different Hollywood cliches, notably near the second act in which Howard, and this is not really a spoiler, introduces a kind of melodramatic romantic subplot between Cruise and Kidman that just feels like a really bad romance novel. Especially when he adds in things like the jealous other man, very over lush backdrops as they get closer, and so on and so forth. Far and Away is still worth a look for basic entertainment. It's good for cheap escapism. It's as far as epics goes, it's not one of the best, but it's not necessarily bad either. But unfortunately, it just doesn't bring that much more to the table. And for that, Far and Away gets a C. Sure. I think we see more of Ron Howard's typical style of focusing on realism and taking kind of a historical drama epic film that this is. I thought that Tom Cruise and Kidman had decent chemistry for what it's worth. I'm not entirely sure how their performances were overall. They were they were okay, I guess. And I guess that's how I really would generally say this film performed. It was okay. I liked the historical backdrop. I liked the ideas of the film, the area of history it was focusing on i always found interesting with irish immigration and the struggles of those newcomers to america in the late 19th century i thought was interesting i liked some of the events that occurred and what they went through and i I did like that the the growth of the characters seemed to flow relatively well but there was a lot of cheesiness and i thought that there were some underperforming elements but overall i'd say it was fun it was steady i didn't get bored i was entertained Overall, I'd say Far and Away gets a C plus. Well, I saw Far and Away originally when it was released in 1992, and I thought it was okay then, and never really gave it much of a second thought, never went back to it, probably would have never watched it again if we didn't watch it for our old classic this week. And after seeing it again, I know why. It was pretty average um i thought it was far too long like i said you know sometimes ron howard does have that problem the accents really really were spotty went in and out up and down all over the place and i thought that was a pretty big fault of the actors and i really find myself not much of a nicole kidman fan i like her in a couple of things that I've seen, but for the most part, I just, I don't think she's a very good actress. She's pretty, I can see why she's the love interest here, but she really just is not that great of an actress. Now, the good things about it are that I do think it looks gorgeous. Like Justin said, you know, the lush backdrops and everything looked very, very nice. 
Um, and the storyline itself is pretty good. It does sort of wrap you up, you know, like Joe said. It, you don't necessarily get bored with it, even though it does go on about 20 minutes too long. It's it's never really that boring. I thought some of the subplots were decent. I do think the romance was a bit of a miss. And I don't know whether that's because I don't particularly care for Nicole Kidman or whether I just thought it was sort of cheesy. Also, the ending to me was a complete letdown. I won't say what happens, but um, I just would have rather it went in a completely different direction. So for me, some good, some bad, and I leave far and away with a B-. minus. What's the direction you would have liked to have gone? I can't really say without giving a spoiler of the complete ending of the movie, but basically what happens at the very end... Mm -hmm. I would have rather seen the exact opposite happen. Oh, okay, you didn't mention that before. You know, I yeah. think that would have been a bolder way to go. It would have been a bolder way to go, and I sort of, uh, in a movie that really didn't take that many chances, I would have liked to have seen one huge one at the end. I actually think that that's a good point, and as Justin and I have remarked, there is kind of a huge silliness <laughs> that the director does kind of take with that. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is knowing Rod Howard movies... You'd think he'd take a risk. You'd think he might take that risk. <laughs> um, you know, and hmm. obviously in 1992, he was a still a young-ish director, mm -hmm. but he had a handful of hits under his belt. Cocoon, Night Shift, these were both from the 80s. Mm -hmm. Uh, parenthood to me that knocked it down a bit hmm interesting yeah but i agree with you i do they still gave it a decent grade i did and, and you know the reason is like i said i think the story on the whole is good mm -hmm. the scenery is gorgeous i think the word with a lot of ron howard films i think the story was wholesome it was wholesome for the most part for the most part i mean it is pg-13 but i think parenthood was also pg-13 and that has a few things in it, but it is still a wholesome story. I guess what brought it down probably was just the cheesy melodrama, and maybe the romance was kind of hit and miss. Yeah, I don't think the accents specifically were as awful as I think Justin did, but they weren't very solid. I mean, when Tom Cruise's accent was on, it was really good. It was decent, yeah. But it was sort of a little bit hit or miss. There were whole scenes in the movie where the accent was absent. I agree. And I, I don't want my distaste for Nicole Kidman to affect my grade too much. I, You know what I mean? Honestly, I could kind of see your problem with Nicole Kidman. However, in the movies that I've seen her in, I think she gives good performances. It's kind of one of those things where it might just be individual tastes, where you might not like a certain actress, which is fine. But I don't think she's a particularly great one. I don't think she's a bad one either. I've seen right. her give some good performances. I've seen her give a couple of good ones. I really enjoyed The Others, for example. That's a good example. Rabbit Hole. Yeah, I love that. that very good example. Rabbit Hole is a, an independent movie that she was in about two years ago that I love. That was, I think, maybe my top ten for that year. But the other things I've seen her in, just Moulin Rouge, obviously, I hate. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. I didn't think she was good in this. A couple other things I've seen her in. But so I didn't want that to cloud my judgment of the grade itself, mm -hmm. just for my own personal taste. But, you know, obviously we're all kind of on the same page here. It sounds you know, like All it. sort of around the C, C plus, B minus range. All right, our final movie this week is The Accused. And this is interesting because I, I don't think with over 70 years of Academy Awards, we're going to very frequently get two released in the same year back-to-back -back on the A to Z. Last week, we did The Accidental Tourist from 1988, which none of us cared for. And this week, we watched The Accused, which had just one nomination, and it won Jodie Foster the Best Actress Award. Joe, tell us about The Accused. Well, The Accused follows Jodie Foster's character, who is a young woman who, quite frankly, after getting drunk and stumbling into a bar late at night, is, brace yourselves, gang-raped. And as she's gang raped by several men, several more men in the bar look on and goad the men on and are basically a part of the crime. And the film basically follows up with Kelly McGillis' character, who is the prosecutor, who attempts to not only put the rapists themselves in prison, but also the individuals who goaded the rapists on, which turns out to be a bit more complicated of a case for them to make. Meanwhile, Jodie Foster also struggles to get this information out and deal with the horrors that occurred. And 
Well, as you guys know, I really like Jodie Foster. I think she's a fantastic actress, and she was robbed in Taxi Driver, I believe, and I think this kind of was making up for it. She gives a brilliant performance here, as she does in many other films. And I thought Kelly McGillis, who is really not an actress that I've seen in too many movies, but she's given some good performances, and I think she does a major, excellent job in this one. I think she should have been given some acknowledgement as well. I think the film really deals with very heavy subject matter, and I think for the time it was made, it's kind of ahead of its time. I think it really does do it in a very poignant way, and it's it's very uncomfortable at certain points, but it does an excellent job with it. Looking at it from the legal perspective and the human perspective, it's very believable, and the dichotomy and the just the chemistry between the two main actresses is really, really good. There are a few moments where I feel like the film is maybe a little dated. There are some points where I dare say it could borderline on cheesy, but considering the fact that I could see certain characters acting a certain way and saying certain things, I can't really put that against the film. I just think it was excellently executed, and I give it an A. Um, Well, it's interesting to me that Kelly McGillis actually got top billing on the film's poster. The thing is... She was a big star at the time, and as we briefly mentioned... Oh, she was, she had yeah. a, She had a couple big films under her belt. I mean, she had Top Gun, she had Witness. She was well-known. And Jodie Foster was kind of known, but she was nowhere near as big a star as she is now. She was right. still kind of coming on her own. I think that up until The Accused, the only real major role she had was probably Taxi Driver, in which she was very young. So she was probably slowly building up then, and this was her first real recognition as a great actress. Yeah, and she definitely deserved that uh, Oscar that she got. But I do have to say, Kelly McGillis was phenomenal. I was surprised. I, I thought she did such a good job as the DA here. My biggest problem with the movie is that uh, other than Foster and McGillis, most of the other actors were pretty cheesy. They were pretty, and I, I don't even mean like for the 80s, they were just cheesy in general. I thought they were either over dramatic or not dramatic enough, kind of stiff, or, you know, there's a couple of guys obviously in a movie like this that are super creeps, and their creepiness almost comes off as not comedic, but just awkward, I guess. But what I really think was the most interesting about this movie is just getting to see the timeline of everything playing out. Because the whole movie is pretty much hearsay. We're very much led to believe that Sarah, which is Jodie Foster's character, is telling the truth. But we never actually see anything take place until towards the end of the film. And even then, it's by a witness. So, obviously, we're led to believe that this is what happened. And it's clear that she was drunk, she admits that. But we kind of get to play the jury in a way, since we never really see what happened. We see things the same way that the jury in the movie does. And I thought that was a really, really interesting way to go with it. Because they could have opened the movie with the intensity of a rape scene. Mm -hmm. But the first thing we see is her running out from the bar, and the person who actually we see later on the witness stand is making a 911 call. I do agree. That's actually one of the most unique storytelling elements of the film is that they don't go right into that. They build it up and they right. kind of do slowly go by fact and fact and build up that timeline so that when the truth is revealed, it's all the more dramatic. Right. And when we meet some of these creepier people, they sort of drop hints about what did happen. So, you know, you kind of get the sense that, okay, this really, really happened just the way she's saying it. But it is sort of a unique perspective. There's one point you brought up, which I I know was probably going to bring some grades for the film down, which I understand. You did mention that a lot of the other actors were a bit cheesy, yeah. some of the things they said. But I couldn't really say that I didn't believe that some of those people would say that or act that way in the situation. I could I could believe well, it. Well, yeah, there were some creeps for sure. And I think that creepiness... That, I was sold on that, you know. But I mean, even, even like uh, the DA's boss or Jodie Foster's boyfriend. Maybe a little hammy? Yeah, a little hammy. A little hammy. and Maybe a little bit. Uh, you do have to take into account the movie's 80s-ness, for sure. And the soundtrack definitely compounds that. And that's the next thing I was going to say. You know, the soundtrack <laughs> is solely from the late 80s. 
you know, we joked when we watched the movie that as the credits were about to roll, I really expected them to break into like journey, a great, or yeah, like we are the accused kind of thing. <laughs> well, and we never saw that, but I wouldn't have been surprised. I, I will admit that I thought that some of the soundtrack choices were good. Some of them were not. Some of them were not. <laughs> some of them were not. And you know, eighties or not. I think that some of the soundtrack choices did bring it down a little bit for me. A little bit, yeah. The tone was a bit off at some points. Yeah, I agree. But overall, the movie really is great. Like you said, though, it is a hard watch sometimes. Mm -hmm. There are some scenes that are very intense. And unlike Rush, where I could just look away, it's the dialogue that's that's rough here. Mm -hmm. There's some visuals as well. But the dialogue is, is really frank and you know in some places very disturbing it's it's really i think jodie foster just her her acting really breathes life in that character and i think Mm -hmm. it's even more so than the visuals i think it's what kind of makes it difficult to bear yeah i would agree with that uh i leave the accused with a b plus justin all right well i gotta completely echo both of you on the terms of that this is a very real story but it's also a very tough to watch real story and i think that's going to divide a lot of people in terms of uh looking into this film one thing that i really did like about this was the overall amount of subtlety in the opening scene where we just focus on simply the bar which we don't know exactly what's going on in there and then we see jodie foster run out and then the witness that becomes relevant later i was really hoping they would just explore that subtlety even further as the story went on but i'll uh, i'll come back to that i thought the interplay between uh jodie foster and Kelly McGillis was absolutely fantastic. Um, Jodie Foster, who I can't say I'm the world's biggest fan of, completely was deserving of the win. And I agree. I was very, very surprised that uh, Kelly McGillis did uh, not get a nomination given that she had top billing. And she really does bring it home. But getting back to the subtlety thing, there's a segment near the end where Jodie Foster is on the stand and she's describing being gang raped. And it's absolutely chilling the way she's going into this and then the witness that we saw from the beginning of the film comes onto the stand and he gives his perspective on the story and instead of just focusing on the monologue we get this graphic dramatization of everything that happened while i get what they were trying to do i couldn't help but think while they were doing this he could have probably given the exact same monologue and had the same chilling effect and not lose any of the overall impact And because of that, I just kept wondering, would this have been a much different, much stronger movie if they had played that, played that realm of subtlety? You mean without the visual? Without the visual. Like Mm -hmm. kind of the way they were doing it with her when she was describing it, the slow pan, kind of the same thing with him. Exactly. I have a pan over the jury's faces. I like that idea, but I have a rebuttal. They already did that with Jodie Foster. It would be doing the exact same thing over again. Perhaps it would have been repetitive, but I don't think we necessarily needed a graphic dramatization. We know what, what happened. And I think Maybe the, fact, not. the fact that we were making up the idea of what happened in the audience's minds mm-hmm. is a much creepier concept. Mm-hmm. I agree with that, and I think that's an interesting take. But I will say this. The Jodie Foster testimony towards the end of the film is not long because she doesn't really want to talk about it too much mm. it this, this kid's testimony is long i mean he, he goes into just, he goes into very vivid details about what happened you're right and it's a good 10 12 minutes of the, of so the movie 10, i don't think without any visual uh, it would have been very exciting i do agree 10 How, 12 minutes is probably a little however much. his testimony is often done with intercuts so i'm not quite sure if it would have actually been a full-blown 10 minutes if, if they tried to be as descriptive as they were with the visuals, as you're suggesting, it probably would have been a lengthy one. Who would have known? We only saw we only saw what he was describing through the testimony, which was then which then led to the graphic dramatization. I don't know. I think that's kind of one of the more memorable aspects of the film is that they were bold enough to do that as opposed to not doing that, which most films didn't do. Uh, oh, don't get me wrong. It was bold, and I'm not saying it wasn't effective. It was. I'm just saying I don't think it would have lost anything if they had just focused on the overall testimony and let the actors shine through. That, that is a cool idea. I do think it would have worked that way, too. I oh, wouldn't be surprised, though, if that particular scene and Foster's vulnerability in it got her the Oscar. I think that is a very strong, strong scene in the film. And I'm not saying that the theater of the mind couldn't have maybe also done it justice. 
I just think that the intensity of that performance is one of the better parts of the film. But uh, getting back to my overall grade, I do admit I think it fell prey to a couple of 80s cliches. Honestly, I'm going to play devil's advocate and say Spirit of the Times factored into it. And that's okay. I mean, it happens to the best of them. But overall, I thought that this was a good film. I just thought that if Subtlety had been the star of the show, this would have been a significantly better movie. The Accused gets a B. Yeah, I, don't get me wrong about the 80s stuff. It, it didn't bring my grade down at all. I just thought, because it is a product of the time, but some of their choices of the soundtrack, not just the fact that it sounded 80s, but... Too upbeat? Yeah, it was a little too upbeat for my taste for, for this movie. Um, one thing I, I think we do have to consider, though, with this film is just how groundbreaking it was at the time. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, this is 1988. People on the whole in these sorts of situations didn't really do much about it. Mm. And and this is sort of bringing light onto a subject that maybe didn't get talked about a lot at the time. I mean, obviously, I was alive in 88, but I was a little young to be hearing about this kind of stuff anyway. Mm. But just on the whole, I think it's just a groundbreaking film. And let's just think for a second how The Accidental Tourist from the exact same year was up for four Oscars, including Best Picture, and the only nomination this movie even got was Best Actress. I think that's a shame. That confounds me. It really is. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this, it, if you're going to put Accidental Tourist in the Best Picture race, this certainly deserves to be right up there alongside. And we talked last week about other films that maybe could have gotten the job done, like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit or a Big. Mm-hmm. But this movie certainly deserves to be up there in, in the Best Picture graces, I think. Definitely. I would, I would really have nominated it. Absolutely. All right, well, we are just about out of time for this week's show. Uh, you can catch Joe's very own YouTube channel at Merlin Boss. And uh, anything uh, new and improved on there? Oh, I'll be pumping out some new videos probably regarding The Walking Dead. And I also dabbled into finally watching the Green Arrow TV show on CW, so I have some thoughts on that. All right, and you can check those out at Merlin Boss on YouTube. And, of course, you can check us out on YouTube as well at uh, Film Finax. You can subscribe to us and check out all of our past podcasts also the facebook group up and running film fanatics with an exclamation point at the end and our twitter which is at film fanatics pod thanks for listening and we'll see you back here next week bye